okay guys this is a long one it's about 30 minutes maybe more but we're going to do our notes on industrialization immigration and urbanization um it's a lot of fun so it's going to overlap with our next unit which is the roaring 20s um so i'm going to go over this fairly quickly try to give you as much input as i can um, again if you have any questions please just let me know all right industrialization so after the civil war you basically have to rebuild the entire south and the south was what was coming up with the textiles um, for manufacturing in the north and so the second industrial revolution is led by scientists and inventors um, you have factories that are producing new goods quicker and able to sell them globally the government is going to encourage uh, immigration because the more factories you have the more jobs you have the more people that can come over um, and then also you have the expansion of the railroad, which makes it getting around the country really easy, which makes shipping really easy. Um, Vanderbilt is going to come in with a lot of his shipping industries, um, and he's going to make a mint, guys. This guy is so rich. We're going to talk a lot about a lot of these rich guys. Um, so, yeah. Next is improved technology. So inventors and innovators are going to fuel the industrial uh industrialization of the 1800s people like Thomas Edison and uh, the Kodak camera all of these things are going to um, come out of this time period <clears throat> and it just makes things practical um, and so how did communication and transportation change um, you have the transatlantic telegraph um, you have the telephone transcontinental railroad which we already talked about is finished um, you have automobiles and airplanes that all come in this time period which make um, traveling really easy which make communicating across the country really easy um, it just really unifies the country more than it had ever really been unified beforehand we talked about the impacts of the transcontinental railroad so just imagine what it'd be like if you just call somebody Okay, so I've mentioned innovators and inventors. The difference is an innovation is just a different use of an already invented product. So Henry Ford did not invent the assembly line or interchangeable parts, but he put them together. He innovated the process to make cars more affordable. And that's what really makes him famous because of that. Um, the Bessemer process was invented to keep steel at an affordable price, which gives you those really tall skyscrapers um, that we see that are iconic today, um, especially of this time period. All right, and so our famous guy, Thomas Edison, he is going to invent some of the most important things that we use still today. He invented the phonograph, which was the first recorded sound. We still use those principles today, like what I'm doing right now, recording this voiceover. Some of those principles are still used. Um, the light bulb, again, he innovated it. He found a cardboard filament um, in order to make it last longer. Motion pictures um, was called a strip kintograph. Um, basically, you just spin it really fast and it makes the pictures move, but there's still pictures spun really fast. You guys know those little cartoons you can draw on a piece of paper. Um, and then next, Probably the most important thing is the ACDC big old dilemma. And not ACDC as in the rock band, but ACDC as alternating current and direct current. Um, direct current is when you have a generator that is a supplying currents directly to the source. And alternating current, it goes through some sort of interchangeable parts. Um, Edison thought that DC current is the safest one, was the best one, and then his understudy, Nikola Tesla, championed alternating current. And because Tesla went against Edison, um, Edison went on this smear campaign of Tesla, and basically Tesla was right. We use alternating current today. Direct current, the only thing that we use direct current for today is the electric chair. So you can tell that <laughs> he was wrong. It's the one thing that he was really wrong about, but it showed him kind of in a negative light because of how he treated Tesla. So what new industries get developed? You have Andrew Carnegie with steel, um, with he used the Bessemer process. Um, here in North Carolina, you have the Haynes brothers who start a textile mill village. And a mill village is basically all the employees live in the town um, that is owned by Haynes and they work for Haynes. So they get paid from Haynes, they shop at a store owned by Haynes. So basically all that money is just getting funneled into the Haynes brothers. Um, and there's no real regulation on that. Uh, but that's kind of how Winston-Salem was started, was a, as a mill village. Uh, and then you have the Reynolds and the Duke Tobacco Company in Durham, North Carolina. Reynolds and the Duke brothers started making cigarettes. And now you have Duke Hospital that is a major cancer researcher. So they caused a problem, now they gotta fix it. <laughs> 
Then you have Rockefeller Oil. So he started the Standard Oil Company and he slowly began buying up smaller companies and eventually led to a Supreme Court um, banning monopolies because he owned like 90% of the oil business. Um, here in High Point, we always talk about it, it's the furniture capital of the world. And they got their start in this time period in the early 1900s, uh, manufacturing and marketing um, furniture to the entire country. Um, these impacts lasted today and we still have these companies around. Uh, Andrew Carnegie in his steel empire is known as U.S. Steel and it's still around today. Hanes, you can go to Walmart right now and buy some Hanes underwear or some socks. Do what you need. Um, Duke and tobacco, obviously we know that that was North Carolina's number one um, crop. Rockefeller Oil is really interesting because it is actually broken up into about six different companies like Citgo, Exxon, Mobil, um, because they would come into a town, start a gas station, let's say, um, and then the mom and pop shop across the corner would be selling gas for 60 cents. Well, then Rockefeller comes in and sells it for 55 cents, just five cents difference, but the mom and pop shop can't keep up. So they eventually go out of business, sell to Rockefeller, and then Rockefeller, there's no competition, so he jacks the price up to a dollar, and you have no way to stop that. So we have impacts of new industry come out of this. Um, you have a decrease for skilled craftsmen. You don't need someone who knows how to make an entire guitar. You just need one person to attach the front, one person to attach the back, one person to attach the strings. And then all day long, you're just attaching the strings. So that gives you an increased need for unskilled laborers, which is going to lead to hiring children um, because they can be cheaper labor. They've got tiny hands that can fit in these machines. Um, there's no regulation on child labor, so they can work as long or as hard for as less as you want to pay them. Uh, you have a bunch of people moving to the cities for these jobs because now you don't need a skilled laborer. You don't need to have any skills. You just need to come in and put the screw in the exact same place 400 times during your 12-hour shift. Um, and you also have a decreased need for farmers because um, farms are able to store food longer and sell these things to the masses. So you don't need everybody to have a farm. You need, you know maybe 20 large farms, and then everybody else needs to go work in a factory to produce things for the farm or for the stores or whatever um, need be. So it really changes the way people look at what you're going to do for a job. Um, and it changes the way that people look at kids. Um, and so we're going to look at the quality of life because that kid piece is really a big um, motivator to change things. The family structure changes, women go to work, kids go to work, so you don't have just, oh, the man's bringing home the bacon. You have everybody is working to, you know, get a little bit of money in order to survive, which leads to the social structure changing. You can, more people are able to climb the social ladder because the more money you have, the more, um, accepted you are into that influential society and a middle class emerges it's not people that are super impoverished and it's not people that are super rich it's that somewhere in the middle that they are able to do fun things and they have a little bit of extra money but not you know boatloads <laughs> um so it, it it really emerges in this time period and then on the other spectrum, you have the working class. So these are the ones that are going to be the poorest of the poor. They're going to face long hours. And when I say long hours at work, I mean like 12 to 14 hour shifts. No regulation on these things. Um, they have poor working conditions. They would lock doors because they didn't want people coming in and out of things. Um, they would... Uh, search your stuff to make sure you weren't stealing from them. They could just get fired on a whim. Uh, they have really low wages. I mean, like living on somewhere between like 15 and $20 a week um, for a whole family. And then if you have a middle class and a working class, you obviously have the elite class and they're the ones making the money off of these two new groups. Um, immigrants are going to mostly make up that working class uh, because they come over and they're willing to work for less because it's more than what they had. Um, more jobs will always lead to an increase of immigration. 
uh, and that increase of people in urban areas because you have factories in urban areas like cities leads to crowding and so you have tenements and we'll really get to tenements um, in the next couple slides but it is a vocab word so immigration immigration happens during this time period always as urbanization increases so does immigration and urbanization just means the development of cities and so these are people that actually came over um, this is a European family from I don't know where but they're coming to Ellis Island um, this next picture you see is a poorer family this is all that they own they're a little bit dirty they would have come over in steerage um, it would have been a really really tough choice to come over uh, but they have no other options this is a picture um, taken off of angel island coming over from asia and we're going to get to both islands ellis and angel as well then you have industrialization how does it encourage immigration like i said more jobs more people uh, please watch these two videos. The first one, the top one is about Ellis Island and the bottom one is about Angel Island and it tells you good stories about people coming over to both of them and how long they operated and why they came over. So people, depending on where they were coming from, were fleeing lands where they were persecuted religiously. They were coming away from famines. You guys have all heard about the Irish potato famine. I know you guys are probably chuckling right now. Um, and then you have really extreme poverty faced in these cities uh, or in these countries that they're fleeing. Um, all immigrants just, you know, that whole idea of the American dream comes out during this time period. Immigrants come over seeking better jobs, thinking I can make money, I can work my way up to a middle class and eventually even become an elite class. And that does happen. Um, so what challenges were faced by immigrants as they moved to America? You have quotas, meaning they would only have a certain number of people from each country come over, which leads to racism. People will think, oh, we have enough people from, I don't know, Germany. So let's not let any more Germans come over. And then everyone's like, ew, Germans. Obviously, that's not exactly what they said. But um, it just, it really led to some really poor conditions, especially poor living conditions. Like I said, tenements, um, they came with little money. So they would just send it back. And a tenement is just a really crowded, dirty apartment. It's really bad. It's one bedroom. You have your kitchen, your bathroom, and your bedroom all in one room. So imagine living in one room during this quarantine with like your whole family. That's a tenement. And then on top of that, you have language barriers. And if you can't speak English, it's really hard to find a job. So you can't get out of your poor living condition because you can't make money because you don't know the language. So no one will hire you. So therefore you're just trapped. Because of quotas and language barriers and fear of people um, coming from other countries and taking American jobs, you face a lot of prejudices. Um, and so you get these really pretty awful ads in newspapers and they won't let certain races of people live in certain neighborhoods. Um, and so because of all these cultural differences, they face a need to either assimilate um, and get rid of all of their culture or face these pretty horrific prejudices. Um, but they want to keep their heritage alive. So they settle in parts of the city that are most like them, which is why we get Little Italy, Chinatown, um, things like that. So my family grew up in New York, um, my dad's side of the family, the Puerto Rican side. And they lived in uh, Brooklyn in a little neighborhood and everybody in a six block radius were all Puerto Rican. And that's just what my grandmother and my Oello knew <clears throat> was this area. So that kind of permeates every major city. So you're going to find those places in New York. You're going to find them in San Francisco, Los Angeles. There's going to be districts that really groups of cultures settle together. And so then how did that influence the development of North Carolina in the United States? You get what we call the melting pot. And we've all heard those words, the melting pot. And basically what that means is that immigrants, instead of fully assimilating into what is quote unquote American culture, they start to leave their mark on the American identity through food, ethnic communities, reform movements, all of these things really 
permeate from other cultures touching the American identity. I encourage you to watch that video down at the bottom. You might need to log into Discovery Ed in order to view it. It is really good and it really talks about the immigrants perspective of this time period. And so you have a bunch of rapid growth of cities. You have a ton of immigration. You've got really rich people taking advantage of really poor people. And so we need reform again. And so we have a big reform movement for the Civil War. Civil War breaks out. People stop thinking about that. It comes back during this time period. And those people that wanted the reforms are known as progressives. They wanted to reform everything. Labor, temperance, food production, environmental issues, race issues, poverty, policies, um, education, and women's rights. Those things we still talk about and still debate on today. Uh, minimum wage is labor, food production, what foods are going, what chemicals are going into our foods, environmental issues, global warming. You guys see that it's it literally hasn't changed in the last 100 years of what we talk about. But they do use many tactics like protests, strikes, rallies, marches, speeches, journalism. We get a lot of really good content for history during this time period because people are being active in their communities, active in their country to try to get things to be better for the general masses. And so we're going to talk about labor, food production, temperance, um, race and poverty issues, and then women's suffrage. So those are going to be our four big points. First off is labor. These two videos are really, really good at highlighting what the working conditions were like for children in this time period, because more and more children were not going to school. They were going to work um, because they were using that money for their families. Children worked as coal miners in factories, on construction sites. They sold newspapers. Parents would make their kids work as early as eight years old. Eight. They would send them into the mines at eight. <laughs> Working conditions are awful. Um, kids were working 12-hour shifts and were doing mostly the more dangerous work um, because their hands were smaller so they could fit into the machines and, you know, get the thread out right or they could fit into a smaller crevice to put the dynamite in the coal mines. It was insane what they were allowing kids to do. So please watch these two videos. It really talks about child labor um, in the early 1900s and why it was an issue and why people saw it um, as a problem that needed to be fixed. Child labor is not the only one, but it's the one that really shapes the labor movement. And so that's why I kind of focused on that one. But there were a lot of issues. And you're going to see a couple more videos about labor strikes um, in the upcoming slides. Do, do, do. Okay, food production and temperance. Um, Upton Sinclair is probably the most famous author of this time period. He wrote The Jungle, which brought to light the horrors of the meat packing packing plants. Sorry, that's hard to say. Meat packing plants. Uh, the FDA was created as a result of this time period. Basically, there was this huge meat scandal that actually Teddy Roosevelt, what what, uh, discovered that they were not taking health precautions while they were packing meats to go into the stores. So they would butcher the animal around rats with no gloves on um there there was no refrigeration so things that were getting sold in the store were making people sick it was disgusting guys i cannot explain to you how disgusting so this is a political cartoon of teddy roosevelt you see where it says meat scandal he's raking it up and it says investigation on there i know you can't really see it because the quality of this photo um but he was really a big proponent of fixing the meat packing industry and he teamed up with Upton Sinclair and really fixed a lot of that fixed by legislation. As you can see in here, these guys are just in like jackets or not even jackets, no gloves. People are just walking around. There's pig flesh hanging from the ceiling while they're cutting things off. It's disgusting, guys. Um, and so I just, you know, take a minute to look at this image. So along with food production, there's also the temperance movement, and this is the one that is going to get us to 
uh, prohibition, where they prohibit the sale of alcohol. And the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Unit, was established after the Civil War, um, and this is when thousands of European immigrants were flooding into the cities. And after the passage of the 16th Amendment, which is you get money from income taxes, the government gets money from income taxes, um, the government didn't need the money from alcohol tax. So combined with anti-German feelings of this immigration period, because Germans, Oktoberfest, they definitely just, beer was part of their culture, um, and the WCTU, um, and then again, the Anti-Saloon League, there's so many things that lead to prohibition. And in this time, this is about the 1880s, you got about 40 years, and we are going to prohibit all sale of alcohol. We're going to talk about that when we get to the 1920s. Um, but this is where it really starts to ramp up. And we get those temperance movements as historians know and think about it. This is the time that it really gets um, amped up. Next is race and poverty issues. And I'm going to super zoom in on North Carolina for this racism um, with the race riots of 1898 um, in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, an African American won an election, meaning that he was elected to office in the local government. He was an African American, and about 2,000 white men stage a coup, um, which is a forceful takeover of a government, and they expel all elected African Americans. That means the population of Wilmington elected them. They wanted them to be in office. Um, well, these white guys kick them out. They destroy property and newspapers owned by African Americans. It's written in the newspapers. It's a really big, awful mark on North Carolina history, but it shows you the race relations during Jim Crow in the South. Um, and so this leads to the Great Migration, where a lot of African Americans move up north. In these big cities, in the north or even in the south, poverty is probably the biggest problem that America faced with the rise of industry. Um, Jacob Reese is a photographer. He's going to take, I think, about six of these pictures, or five of these pictures are Jacob Reese's, um, that he went through poor neighborhoods to document the extreme poverty faced there. He took pictures of them and he would go and give these presentations to rich people and say, this is what American people are living in. This is what they're facing. And would get people to donate money to, you know, upgrade these tenements or sign petitions to get laws in place that they have, you know, limits set on how many people can be in an apartment. So this is a family, guys. This is a family of about um, six people living in one room. So you have the stove in the corner, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, sorry, seven people, um, and they all live in one room. This is the extent of their house. That's what they live in. You can see the garbage piled up on the ground here. Um, the stairs are messy. Everything just looks really dirty. Uh, this is just stacks and stacks and stacks of people. This is how they were drying their clothes. They would use like just a simple pulley system um, to dry their clothes after washing them. <clears throat> but you're drying them in dirty air outside above everything. So things don't really stay clean. And so you have health issues. Um... It was a really, really scary time. Here's another picture. These are little kids just playing in the mud. You got to think there's no indoor toilets. People are just throwing stuff out of the windows. This would be a penny room where it was one cent to stay here um, and you had to pay each night. If you can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people in this tiny room. Guys, this room would be smaller than, you know, half of a bedroom. Um... It was just a really, really scary time. Watch that video at the bottom. It's really, it's really good. Um, the next thing is women's suffrage. So the National Women's Party, the NWP, under the leadership of Alice Paul, was the loudest voice for women's um, rights. And she was arrested several times and used many different protests. Um, she would do hunger strikes and they would force feed her and she would come out and tell people about it. It was a really, really horrific time. And she did a lot of sacrificial things to prove that women needed a voice. 
watch that music video. It redoes Lady Gaga in a historical context, and you know I'm here for that. This is a picture of Alice Paul. It says, women of America, if you want to vote in 1920, donate those amounts. Um, so she did collect money. This is one of her ladies, and it says Kaiser Wilson. Kaiser is the king of Germany. So during World War I, if you called the president the king of Germany, which is your enemy, it was a really big problem. Uh, but it says 20 million American women don't have are not self-governed, so they don't have the right to vote. So take the beam out of your own eye. So how are you going to go fix Germany's problems when we have problems here? That's her. Again, like I said, watch that video. It's amazing. Whoops. Whoops. So how did the economic growth of the Gilded Age impact North Carolina and the United States? The Gilded Age means that it is lightly covered in gold. So it looks shiny. You have all these really rich people. Um, you have our first millionaires, our first billionaires in this time period. You have a ton of philanthropy where they're giving money to charities. Um, but when you just look just underneath the surface, you see all these problems. You see child labor, you see tenements, you see racism. Um, and so it's got that shine, but it's not real. It's not all the way to the core. Um, and so you have poor conditions for people living, working in factories and living in tenements. You also have monopolies where people are taking advantage of an industry. So we're going to talk about the dichotomy or the, you know, back and forth, the both sides of the coin is what it would mostly be. So this video right here will show a labor struggle between, I think it's Carnegie and what he decided to do when there was a strike. Then you have monopolies and philanthropy, like I had said earlier. Um, massive businesses like Standard Oil wanted to buy out their competition so they could regulate the prices of their products. Um, this created an unfair monopoly and earned the captains of industry, the richest of the richest, the name robber barons. And so you're going to do an activity later where you're going to decide if someone is a captain of industry or if they're a robber baron by looking at their entire like life um and to combat the negative perception of a robber baron someone who's robbing the poor um they started to actively participate in philanthropy and charity giving money away for people to enjoy things so like Carnegie Hall is a music hall um the Met the art museum in New York that was created by one of these big families um as well as giving away to charities and stuff like that Carnegie ends up giving away 90 percent of his wealth before he dies um and his family are still millionaires guys so if you give away 90 percent of your money 90% you only have 10% left to give to your family and your family is still millionaires you have a ton of money it's unimaginable the amount of wealth that these guys had at this time period and with all that money comes this sense of I own it so I can do it and you get political machines people are buying politicians what guy is going to let me do what I want if I give him a hundred dollars a week um and you get guys like Boss Tweed of Tammany Hall. Watch this video. It explains it really, really well. Where they rig elections um, and they buy votes or they scare people with baseball bats at the voting polls um, from voting if they were going to vote against the candidate that they wanted. This is incredibly illegal. And today you can't even put a flyer up um, outside of voting polls to try to intimidate people. All right, guys, last slide. You're almost there. We have the amendments. And so we talked about the 13th, 14th, and 15th in the last unit. Now we're going to talk about the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th in this unit. Um, you have the 16th Amendment, which I said earlier, you shall have, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on income. So a percentage of your check goes to the federal government. That's why you do your taxes each year so they can give you money back if they took too much. Um, and then the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state every six years. Basically, to stop political corruption, they gave term limits to senators. After six years, they have to get reelected. The 18th Amendment is what I had talked about earlier. That is the Prohibition Amendment. No alcohol shall be produced 
bought, sold, or consumed in the United States that only lasts for about 10 years because everyone gets sad. Uh, then the 19th Amendment is women get the right to vote. You cannot deny someone the right to vote on the account of their gender. Um, so everyone, every American now has the right to vote, no matter your skin color or your gender, your height or what state you're from, you get to vote. Um, and that kind of sums up this time period. There's a lot that goes into this, so we're going to have a couple more assignments. Um, here are some pictures of Maven and Mabel, and Maven looking like a sassy friend in her jacket. She's my co-worker. She helps me grade all your work. Just kidding. She makes a lot of noise. She says bye-bye. Love you guys.